You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello and welcome to episode 329 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Kovart. This is an episode you've been waiting for. Over the years, you have asked me for an episode about Freemasonry and its role in early America. And today, I am happy to fulfill your request. Mark Tabert, the Director of Archives and Exhibits at the George Washington Masonic National Memorial Association and the author of numerous books about the history of Freemasonry in the early United States, joins us so we can investigate and better understand Freemasonry and the role it played in the history of early America. Now, during our investigation, Mark reveals the origins of Freemasonry and its activities, how Freemasonry made its way to North America and became an American institution, and details about Freemasonry's role in the American Revolution and in the formation of the new United States. But first, if you have suggestions for episodes, you should email me. I keep a list of what everyone is asking for, and the digital audio team and I really do our best to cover as many of your requests as we can. My inbox is always open for you. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. And now, let's go meet our guest historian. Joining us is the Director of Archives and Exhibits at the George Washington Masonic National Memorial Association. He's the author of numerous books about the history of Freemasonry in the United States, including a collection called Almanac of American Freemasonry, a two-volume work that explores Freemasonry in colonial British North America from 1730 to 1779, as well as a book called A Deserving Brother, George Washington and Freemasonry. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Mark Tabert. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, we're really excited to have you, Mark, because we have a lot of questions about Masons and their role in early America. Now, as I think we're all aware, in American popular culture in the past and in our present, Americans really have viewed Freemasonry in a couple of different ways. One is, is that Freemasons serve the public good. They're part of a larger philanthropic organization. And the other is, is as an organization that serves its own and likely clandestine interests as a powerful secret society. Now, I realize I've simplified our common understandings of Freemasonry, and as I really suspect, we have a lot of information wrong in there. Mark, could we begin by having you tell us a bit about Freemasonry, what it does, and about the different activities that Freemasons do? Sure. So Freemasonry is a fraternal organization in the same way that the Order of Elks or the Moose or the Knights of Columbus or even the Rotary or the Kiwanis are fraternal organizations or Sons of Italy or other organizations like that. But it happens to be the oldest and most complicated fraternal organization, but it's fundamentally a social fraternal organization. It's also fundamentally a self-improvement organization. While these other fraternal organizations may have more social activities like the Elks or the Moose, or they may do more community service like the Rotary Club, or they may be specifically for an ethnicity like the Sons of Italy or the Hibernians, Freemasonry's purpose is to improve the individual man who then should ought to prove society as community. Freemasonry does that through teaching intellectual, moral, and spiritual truths through three initiation ceremonies or degrees. Freemasons have been around for at least 300 years and quite longer. Nobody knows exactly where Freemasonry comes from. It has no one founder like Paul Harris invented the Rotary Clubs or, you know, Henry Ford created the Ford Motor Company, there is not one person who created Freemasonry. The best we can tell and the best research has determined that Freemasonry grew out of Scottish stonemasons' guilds, that is, the stonemasons who built castles and churches in Scotland, beginning around 1600 and over a period of 100 years or so, transformed or evolved into what became a fraternal organization. The two posts or the two landmarks that we know this is, there is a Scottish stonemasons guild in Edinburgh called Mary's Chapel Guild 
that accepted a gentleman, a non-stone mason, into the guild in 1599. And those minute books, that record still exists. And in the 1720s, 1721, probably the Grand Lodge of England was formed in London. And that was a fully formed fraternal organization with a few operative stonemasons in it, but the vast majority were gentlemen or what became to be known as speculative masons or Freemasons. So during that 100-year period or so, there was a transition between strictly a stonemasons guild or more largely a gentleman's organization. Of course, there's always stonemasons in Freemasonry, and there still are today. And those guilds in Scotland still continue on a certain level. But there is a sort of a transition away from being specifically a guild to benefit the members of a craft. So for Freemasonry today, and since really the 1720s, when the notion of what we would call speculative masonry was articulated first by James Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons published in 1723 in London, is that Freemasonry's purpose is to confer initiation ceremonies that teach certain truths, such as the seven liberal arts and sciences, to then bring men together of different points of view and walks of life into a fraternal organization for the betterment of society and of benevolent purposes. Over a period of time, Freemasonry, because it is a wide open organization and the initiation ceremonies have been published in exposés since the 1720s, men and women have used the fraternity for all sorts of other purposes because it has become something of a folk way. So if you get a hold of the rituals, you can create your own Masonic organization. And so those are where it gets really, really gray and really, really confusing, especially between the 1720s and the 1820s in the United States. It sounds like Freemasonry started as a guild practice in Scotland. And of course, being part of a guild was not only to control prices and goods, but the quality of those prices and goods. So guilds often had programs where someone would be say, a journeyman, and improve their craft until they were good enough to be a master craftsman. And then slowly, over 100 years or so, as guilds kind of lose their power, Freemasonry seems to have morphed into a gentleman's self-improvement society. Yes, that's correct. But Freemasonry's foundation is still that guild system and the rules and regulations, the constitutions, are predicated on what are called the ancient charges that these guilds made up going back to the 1300s, about how a stonemason should operate. And within that guild system, stonemasons used the building of King Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, as found in the books of Kings and Chronicles, as their form of legitimacy and of their heritage, in the same way that carpenters would have St. Joseph as their patron, or St. Peter would be the patron of fishermen. And in that guild system and the adoration of King Solomon's temple, that story is how Solomon brought craftsmen from all over the Holy Lands to build the temple to God in Jerusalem. And Freemasonry used that notion to bring good men together, or what we call the brotherhood of man beneath the fatherhood of God. And those guild systems had three degrees of expertise, apprentice, fellow, and master of the trade. And Freemasonry today has three initiation ceremonies, entered apprentice, fellow craft, and Master Mason. And once you move through those three degrees, which are allegorically based on King Solomon's temple, then you become a full member of the lodge. You mentioned that Freemasonry is the oldest and probably most complicated fraternal organization that there is. And you mentioned the Masonic Lodge. So Mark, could you help us better understand the organizational structure of Freemasonry and what role lodges play for Freemasons? Freemasonry was formed like a folkway from town to town, lodge to lodge, brother to brother. There was never a a top-down structure in the sense that you would have a corporation today picking locations to put new franchises in the way McDonald's or Starbucks does. Freemasonry grew across Great Britain and, and into North America around the world as men of those fraternal organizations immigrated or migrated. Lodges in North America were formed as individual immigrants came into this country in the 1720s and 30s and found themselves and then decided to form a lodge. Their earliest lodges are in Boston and Philadelphia in the 1730s. The Grand Lodge of England, which was formed in London in 1717, they attempted to create authority over Freemasonry, which they had no right to do, but they saw it as chaotic and why not try to gain authority. When they did that in the 1720s, they issued 
the grand constitutions and they try to regulate and issue charters or warrants to determine which lodges were legitimate and which were not in the same way that there's an accreditation system today. This spooked in some ways the Freemasons who were operating in Ireland and certainly the Scottish Freemasons. Then the Scottish Freemasons formed their own Grand Lodge in 1736 and the Grand Lodge of Ireland was formed in 1726, I believe. So they started to issue charters in Europe and then in North America with the first duly chartered lodge in Boston in 1732. And in time, and just like you would imagine in a diocese system, as lodges formed in a particular geographical area, then a new diocese or a new Grand Lodge was formed. So once there were five or six lodges in Virginia, then there was a Grand Lodge form in Virginia. And then they chartered lodges in Kentucky, and those individual lodges in Kentucky, once there was enough of them, formed their own Grand Lodge. And that's how Freemasonry spread across North America and around the world. So geographical areas would be determined to be strong enough to support a Grand Lodge, and then they would become independent. In the United States, therefore, we would count 52 Grand Lodges, the 50 states, one in the District of Columbia and one in the District of Puerto Rico. And they are in a confederation and a mutual agreement. So I'm a member of a lodge in Iowa. I'm a member of a lodge in Massachusetts. And I'm a member of a lodge in London. And they're all very, very similar, but they're all regional and they have their own peculiarities and their own styles. There is no national Grand Lodge, but there's a general understanding of how things work and mutual recognition. But if one Grand Lodge or one Masonic organization does something very radical that would be against the ancient traditions of the fraternity, they could be expelled or excluded or they could withdrawal recognition in the same sort of diplomatic ways that goes on between countries. And then there's always diplomacy in a way to recognize each other and try and heal that because as a fraternity, we want to maintain that brotherhood. I wonder if we could talk a bit more about how and why Freemasonry came to North America. It sounds like Masonic lodges start as local institutions, and it also sounds like they begin to form, you know, in North America around the 1720s when places like Massachusetts really would have had big enough towns to support a membership of a fraternal organization. So, Mark, is that how it roughly worked? And did Freemasonry ever struggle to take hold in North America? Because a lot of colonists didn't necessarily live in the urban centers along the Atlantic coast. They're settling in the frontier places or what was considered the frontier at the time. So with this scattered settlement, did Freemasonry struggle to take hold at times? One of the things that's interesting and one of the stuff that I've been writing about, especially in relationship to George Washington joining a lodge in the 1750s when he was 20 years old, and then the almanac that I've been working on documenting these lodges throughout the 1700s, is that because Freemasonry is essentially a folk way, it's essentially immigrants doing the things that immigrants do and looking for each other and then trying to organize as they try to find a place to live and build their business and create a family in the same sort of way. Freemasonry was very scattered and haphazard in any kind of organization in the 1730s. Men would get together and organize and hold meetings. They would initiate people and bring them into the fraternity, and then those people would move someplace else. They would take what they knew or what little they knew and did other things with them. So there was a lot of ups and downs. And then in the 1750s, a brand new form of Freemasonry showed up, which they called themselves the ancient craft Freemasonry that was in rivalry, which they labeled the modern or older form of Freemasonry. And there became sort of a schismatic group where there was a rivalry between two Grand Lodges in London, plus Freemasons from Scotland and Ireland, all populating the British colonies in the 1750s, 1760s. Then the same way that you would say, you know, there's the Roman Catholic Church, and then there's German Roman Catholic and Italian Roman Catholic and Irish Roman Catholic churches. And there are different forms of ideas about how those Catholic churches amongst those immigrant communities. And that's part of the reason why the Knights of Columbus was formed, was to bring a fraternal organization across the various ethnicities of Roman Catholics in the United States and to remind the Protestants in this country that a Roman Catholic Columbus got to North America before the pilgrims did. So there was very scattered and very disorganized, and lodges came and went pretty frequently. But in due time, especially in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, they figured out how to way to organize because Philadelphia and Boston was very strong. And through the guidance and perseverance of very dedicated leaders, then the fraternity grew down roots. And by 1775, there were about 100 lodges up and down the East Coast. Only one in Georgia because it was a small colony, but five or six in Virginia and 10 or 12 in Massachusetts. It just depends on the population. 
Freemasonry is fundamentally a cosmopolitan organization. So it's only going to grow when there are men of the middle class or upper class who have the time and energy to participate in that fraternal life or those social activities. You just mentioned that there are different types of Masonic lodges. And Devin wonders about the different organizational types of Freemasonry. Would you tell us about the different types of Freemasonry and whether there are any similarities or differences that existed between, say, Scottish Rite Masons, Orange Lodge Masons, or Prince Hall Masons? I would reckon there's two fundamental differences in Freemasonry that starts in the 1700s and exists today. So on the one hand, you would have the British form of Freemasonry, which is fundamentally sort of constitutional monarch Freemasonry. In Great Britain, the Grand Lodge of England has had numerous sovereigns, kings who were grandmasters, and in Scotland, it's the same. And that tends to be a very conservative, typical British system based on a constitutional monarchy with a form of democracy and representation, as you would see in the House of Commons. That form of Freemasonry exists in 90% of the United States. Most Freemasons are that form of what we would call ancient craft Freemasonry. When Freemasonry, on the other hand, moved into the European continent and in France, because there was a stronger, fiercer nobility and king in France, there was the emperors, and then there was a very strong and dynamic Roman Catholic Church in Italy and Spain and France. That form of Freemasonry became more adapted to or more interested in finding the liberties that the English professed to have. So that form of Freemasonry for the French Revolution became more radicalized in a quest for self-determination, right to peaceably assemble, to elect their own leadership, and even the ideas of a free press and free public schools, all which were threats to the very strong and powerful Roman Catholic Church at the time, and, of course, to the King of France, the various kings and emperors who were running around Europe at the time. Of course, that's all changed. But that after the French Revolution, and there were Freemasons involved with the French Revolution, and they were also persecuted during the French Revolution, that form of radical Freemasonry went to Italy, it went to South America, it still exists in a way that is represented by men like Garibaldi in Italy, or Samoan Bolivar in South America or San Martin. So there is a form of more radically egalitarian form of Freemasonry that comes out of the continent. And the American Freemasonry, our tenets tend to be brotherly love, relief, and truth. French Freemasonry is liberty, equality, and fraternity. And in that form of Freemasonry, you see more women who are members, you see men and women in lodges, and you see lodges allowing atheists to join, which atheists may not join in the British form of Freemasonry at all. As far as the other forms of Freemasonry, those are the two big pictures, right? And within that, there are many other forms of variations because writing rituals, initiation ceremonies is a literary genre. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of forms of initiation ceremonies that are used, again, as a form of entertainment and as a form of a literary exercise that people just enjoy. The same way that people find myths and legends and write operas about them. Let's do an opera about Robin Hood. Let's do an initiation ceremony based on Robin Hood. So as far as Orange Lodges go, Orange Lodges come from an organization that are called the Loyal Orange, blanking on the name, but the Loyal Orange were a Protestant Irish organization. It still exists in Canada. There's a little bit in the United States. And they were basically Protestant Irish who used a lot of symbols of Freemasonry and they tended to celebrate the Protestant side and the Protestant Northern Irish part of Ireland. And we used to celebrate Orange Day in the United States a long time ago, and it gave way to St. Patrick's Day. Prince Hall Freemasonry is a very important form of Freemasonry that began in Boston in the 1780s when a free African named Prince Hall and 13 other free Africans in Boston were initiated into Freemasonry, and they were able to obtain a charter from the Grand Lodge of England, and they became a African Lodge number 459 under the Grand Lodge England in London. And from that lodge, African-American Freemasonry spread to Philadelphia in the 1780s, where Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were Freemasons, to New York and Rhode Island. And from that lodge in Boston and through Prince Hall and his followers, Lewis Hayden and others, spread Freemasonry throughout the United States. There were even lodges in New Orleans before the Civil War, 
And then people like Martin Delaney in Pittsburgh and the Reverend James Hood down in North Carolina after the Civil War were creating free African churches, schools, and lodges throughout the South and out through the West. So African-American or Prince Hall Freemasonry, as it's called, grew as many other African-American fraternal organizations grew after the Civil War and grew next to and intertwined with predominantly white Freemasonry. They are still separate organizations. They have their own Grand Lodge, their own rituals, their own symbols, though it's very, very similar to predominantly white Freemasonry. And in the last 35 years, there's becoming more and more mutual recognition between predominantly white and predominantly black Prince Hall Freemasonry, though they remain separate because they have their own brotherhoods and they have their own missions and own communities that they serve. Laura would really like to know more about early American Freemasonry's ties to Protestant faiths. And she wonders whether any early American Catholics or Jews became Freemasons. So, Mark, would you tell us a bit more about the role that religion played in early American Freemasonry? Obviously, Freemasonry, because it was created in a Christian country at the time when you had an established church, the Anglican Church in England and the Presbyterian Church in Scotland as the state churches, Freemasonry has always been predominantly Christian. But there have been Jews in the fraternity since very early days in the 1720s and 30s. There have been Roman Catholics in Freemasonry because obviously there have been Roman Catholics in England for, you know, what, 1500 years. And of course, later on, there were dissenters or Protestants of other denominations besides the Anglican Church in Freemasonry. That's always been the case. And that's always been what the cosmopolitan nature of Freemasonry has been, is to welcome good men of all faiths into the fraternity to provide that sense of brotherhood and that rising above those bitter fights that were occurring during the wars of religion and the Thirty Years' War and that sort of stuff in the 1500s and 1600s. So Freemasonry has always allowed men of different faiths to be in the lodge. It depends on the individual man, of course, and whether or not they're of good character and well-recommended. Freemasonry, where it's focused on King Solomon's temple and the allegories and the stories surrounding the temples being built and its destruction, Freemasonry and Freemasonry opens all meetings with prayer and closes with prayer. And we have a book of the volume of sacred law, usually a Christian Bible open on the altar, though we often can have a Jewish Bible, we can have the Quran, we can have other holy books on the Bible. Freemasonry is not specifically Christian. We refer to deity as the grand architect of the universe or the great architect of the universe to articulate the creator and that we are all children under the creator, the master workman. Since we are on the topic of membership, you've mentioned numerous times that Freemasonry is a fraternal organization, which presumes that men, and I think you've said all men, could be members. But you also said earlier that women, at least in France or revolutionary France, could also belong to Masonic lodges. So there are lodges for women. Those lodges were created for women by women, or there are also lodges that have men and women in them. Those lodges were created first in France and Belgium, and there are also lodges in England under a Grand Lodge that has amity with the United Grand Lodge of England. There are women lodges in North America, but we don't recognize them as such. Again, anybody who wants to get a hold of the Masonic ritual can call themselves Freemasons. But there's not a mutual recognition because one of the landmarks on Freemasonry is that it is a masculine organization. Its membership is for men only in ancient craft Freemasonry. So in the same way that Freemasonry does not recognize atheists to be able to become a member of our lodges, women are not to be a member of our lodge. It's not Against women, what Freemasonry's purpose is to improve individual men, not to improve individual women. And we're not saying that Freemasonry is not suitable for women. It's none of our business. In ancient craft Freemasonry, we focus on men, encouraging men to move from being juvenile into adulthood. And that's our focus, I would say. We read and talk a lot about early America on this podcast. And when you investigate early America long enough, it's really not hard to come across information about how men like Paul Revere, Benjamin Franklin, and George Washington were Freemasons. Why do you think men like Revere, Franklin, and Washington became Freemasons? And do we know anything about their experience in the Brotherhood? First of all, we'll start with Benjamin Franklin since he's the eldest and 
joined Freemasonry in the 1730s, we have to remember that colonial society was focused towards the British crown. And for anybody in the colonies who was ambitious, they wished to rise in society and then be able to go to England and be received in London and potentially be received at court. And to be able to pick up patronage and support and potentially even other honors from the British crown in order to grow themselves and grow their family. Just as men sought to get commissions in the British Navy or the British military regiments, or they sought appointments in the Anglican Church, there were different ways of trying to rise in society. So Benjamin Franklin, being an extraordinarily intelligent and ambitious man, discovered there was a lodge in Philadelphia meeting. At first, he ridicules it in his newspaper, and then he discovers maybe he should join it because some of the best and brightest in town are members. So he joins the lodge in order to interact with the best and brightest, and he quickly moves through the process, as he would because he's Benjamin Franklin, to become provincial Grand Master of Pennsylvania. But once he's done that and he's been active, of course, he moves on to other things. So he's active in the fraternity in his lodge in Philadelphia for about five or six years, and then he goes on to other things. Those lodges that he was a member of and actually fade away and disappear in the 1750s. He later then, when he's in London, acting as the representative for the colonies to the crown, he visits lodges and affiliates with Freemasonry. And then he attends a lodge in Scotland when he's in Scotland to receive an honorary doctorate from St. Andrew's University. And then later in the 1770s, he participates in lodges in Paris, particularly the Lodge of Nine Muses, which initiates Voltaire a couple of weeks before Voltaire dies. So Franklin, while not really active in a lodge very well, he uses the lodge and the international system and the cosmopolitan nature of Freemasonry to meet different people in many different varieties of situations in Philadelphia and London and Scotland and more especially in France during the revolution. George Washington joins in Fredericksburg Lodge, which is predominantly a Scottish lodge. There are Scottish merchants who are trying to develop the tobacco trade from Virginia into Scotland. And he joins because he's an up-and-coming potential tobacco planter. I mean, he joins as a young man in his hometown. But he quickly leaves the lodge because he serves in the French and Indian War. And after hard service on the frontier, retires from the military. And then he marries Martha Custis and sets aside on running Mount Vernon and being in the House of Burgesses and that sort of stuff. He viewed Freemasonry as something that a young man would join as a rite of passage and a way to be connected to his local community and the men in his hometown. But he went on to bigger and bigger things, obviously. During the War for Independence, Sonic Lodges were formed by Freemasons within regiments, which was a British tradition as well. There were about 10 traveling lodges, as we call, amongst the Continental Army. Washington supported those lodges being formed. He attended one lodge meeting twice, American Union Lodge, and then he was invited to a third, but he was unable to attend. He patronized the fraternity, and then more especially when he became president, he saw the fraternity as an incubator for Republican virtues, to move towards cementing and creating better communities, to encouraging the better and more ambitious men to better education and better community service and to fully participate in what is a new republic. So Franklin's point of view would be more towards an aristocratic patronage system, Washington's Freemasonry, and more especially Paul Revere, would be directed towards a Republican commercial world that was founded after the revolution. And Paul Revere, being a tradesman and a silversmith, family French Huguenots, he is growing and working within Boston. He's trying to find clients. He's trying to develop his trade. He's trying to develop his reputation. He joins Lodge of St. Andrews in Boston in the 1750s, which is another Scottish lodge. And he works through the Masonic system and the lodges in Boston. And in the 1790s, he becomes Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. He never has a reputation higher on the national level. He doesn't serve in the Continental Congress. He doesn't even serve in the Massachusetts Assembly. But he becomes famous as a silversmith. And then, of course, more especially for the Longfellow poem, long after he's passed away. So from Revere's point of view, Freemasonry is a means to grow the community very locally in your own neighborhood, to develop a better reputation amongst your peers and to grow your trade and, of course, encourage commerce. And these are really interesting examples because through Revere, Washington and Franklin, 
we can really see how Freemasonry was at work in early America on, you know, the local, national, and even international levels. Yes, absolutely. And it's the international stuff that leads to the more conspiracy stuff and the revolutionary material that happens really after the French Revolution as French immigrants come to escape the revolution, to escape the terror, Robespierre and Napoleon, they bring their French Freemasonry with them. And that causes a lot of concern, especially amongst Protestant Americans in the 1820s and 30s. Well, before we dive into Masonic conspiracies, I wonder if we could talk a bit more about Freemasonry's role in the founding of the United States. So based on what you were saying, it really sounds like Franklin's membership in Freemasonry and his participation in English and French lodges really helped him with his diplomacy on behalf of the United States. Diplomacy that would secure the French alliance and help the United States become independent. Do you think this was really the case? Do you think his membership in Freemasonry really furthered his diplomacy in this way? I think it would be, as in most cases with Freemasonry, it would be an entry or a calling card, but it wouldn't do more than that. A standard example we would think about this is, and this is true for any other contact, if you're sitting on an airplane or a train or you're in an area with other strangers and you're wearing a lapel pin from the Rotary and there's another Rotarian there, or you're wearing a class ring from a university or college or you're in the Marines or something like that, and people recognize you, oh, you're from Texas, what part of Texas, whatever. Those kind of conversations start in the same with Freemasonry. So you're a Mason, what lodge, where do you are, blah, 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 those sort of things. But, you know, you're going to move through that conversation in about 10 minutes, and then you'll discover if there's something else you have in common. Franklin would use it as an entry because he's a Freemason, but then you have to develop the fellowship and the trust and the mutual respect further than that. And that's true with any kind of identification that people have. Washington, Franklin, and Revere's membership in Freemasonry is really just a sampling of the number of founding fathers who were Freemasons. Mark, was it really just a coincidence that so many of the United States' founding fathers happened to be Freemasons? I think it is a curious thing, but I think it's just the nature of that organization. So Freemasonry was the cutting edge. It was the thing to do. It was the phenomenon that people did who were interested in books and knowledge and education and classical history. And so you would just circulate towards those things, right? So 13 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. That's a remarkable percentage, but it's not a dominant percentage in the same way that there's only been 10 or 12 presidents of the United States who are Freemasons, depending on how you count, that's a significant number, but not compared to the number who were Methodists or Episcopalians or lawyers or farmers or military soldiers. So I do think that Freemasonry in the 1700s during Franklin's life and Washington's lifetime, it was the up-and-coming literary circle. It was the up-and-coming media that people found each other to communicate in the same way that if you're in Boston and there's only one or two bookstores, you're going to be mingling on those bookstores and you're going to find other people. Or if you're in Providence, Rhode Island, and you're interested in books, you would discover the lodge because they're there. So if you're of that strata in society and you're literate, and not everybody was, and have a good reputation, and not everybody was, you would be in that. Certainly part of the reason why Prince Hall and his friends in Boston created that, because they were interested in developing a greater literacy and a greater connections amongst free African-Americans in Philadelphia and Rhode Island and trying to develop that network of prominent people in their community that they were otherwise cut off from. So it's remarkable, but that was the phenomenon at the time. So were there any connections between Freemasonry and influence in the American Revolution? Did Freemasonry impact the revolution in any way? Or was it really just that this fraternal organization and the revolution coexisted and were popular around the same time? I don't think that Freemasonry itself as an organization had any impact on the American Revolution, but obviously individual men who identified as Freemasons, such as George Washington, had a profound impact. Indeed, the two people I would suggest were the most responsible for our independence was Franklin securing French support and Washington fighting a successful war against the British Army. So individual Freemasons, yes, but Freemasonry, again, is just part of the culture of the Enlightenment and is a fruit of that. You would have Freemasonry was just part of that Enlightenment product in the same way that you would have salons in Paris or zoological expositions or literary clubs. It's a similar situation. 
So they're just woven into the fabric of that community. And speaking of Freemasonry operating at this local level, Bonnie wonders whether this fraternal society influenced any British Americans' decisions about whether to remain loyal to the British crown during the revolution or whether to side with the revolutionaries. Is this even something we can know, Mark, you know, whether Freemasonry played a role in individuals' decisions about their loyalty? Not really, no. I don't think Freemasonry had that kind of impact on people's lives when it's life or death between sentimental fraternal organization that has wonderful rituals, initiations, and brother love and fraternalism versus your livelihood, your wealth, your loyalty to your crown, to your king, your family's livelihood and safety. Freemasonry is not going to be a factor in that. I can't think of any reason why it would. In Freemasonry, if you read Anderson's Constitutions, there is a passage about those who would be traitorous to the state. And the answer in that is, Freemason should never be in rebellion against the powers of the state. But if he does go in rebellion, if he does become a traitor, he's not even expelled from the fraternity. He's just pitied as a sorrowful human being for doing such horrible things. But a lot of Freemasons who were in the upper class lodges in Boston, Philadelphia, obviously immigrated out because they were Tories. And the middling class, like a Paul Revere, achieved greater authority and prominence in those lodges as the upper class left the colonies. And a lot of them went to Nova Scotia, obviously, or elsewhere. But in 1783, you had George Washington as the most prominent Freemason in the United States. And then King George III's son, Frederick, was elected Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of England. So it works on both sides. So now we've discussed how Freemasonry didn't really influence or impact the American Revolution beyond the fact that some of the founding fathers, like George Washington and Ben Franklin, were in fact Freemasons, and that lodges could have had a revolutionary bent, but only after many loyalists would have migrated out of revolutionary America. And Rich would like to continue on this train of thought by asking whether the American Revolution impacted Freemasonry and its development in the United States. So it's a question of the American Revolution's influence on Freemasonry versus Freemasonry's influence on the American Revolution. Oh, absolutely. Very much so. I think, again, that there's this cultural revolution that's going on. It's not just a political separation from the British crown, but there is a great, powerful social revolution that turns our country away from patronage and aristocracy towards the idea of republic, of equality, of liberty, of freedom, and the right of self-determination. And Freemasonry has always been part of that. That was always one of the early criticisms of the French crown and the Roman Catholic Church was that how dare men get together and elect their own leaders? This is a direct affront to an aristocracy and the king. Only the king appoints who's in charge. And so this idea of having self-determination to peaceably assemble in private to conduct your business as you see fit without any oversight from anybody from the state or from the church was a very, very revolutionary idea. That's part of the reason why Freemasonry gets mixed up in the French Revolution and other revolutions through the 1840s and even into the 20th century. But with the growth of the independence that's achieved and the unification of the states under the Constitution, Freemasonry really takes off. It grows from about 200 lodges in 1790 to over 400 lodges in 1800. And that's just the population growth. It's the land opening up west. It's more wealth being generated with trade. It's the prosperity that comes with a stable society and with then the state's debt being taken by the federal government. And then, of course, it's Washington's membership in the fraternity and other leaders and governors and local magistrates who are Freemasons that just draws men towards them who wish to achieve a level of respectability, a level of prosperity, and then who are anxious to be good citizens by learning to read, to get a classical education, to network other people, and to secure the blessings of liberty, as we would say. So Freemasonry has transformed. It moves away from some sort of upper class to becoming more and more middling class and becoming more and more diverse. So as I mentioned before, you had French immigrants coming over during the French Revolution but you had German-speaking lodges being formed by German immigrants. You had a Dutch lodge in New York City, of course, and you had other more predominantly Jewish lodges being formed as well in different places. So the fraternity is becoming the gateway to explore all sorts of different ways of communicating and organizing. 
And then new initiation systems or process or rituals are coming in from France, from Germany, and from elsewhere, which are causing a lot of other diversity, what Freemasonry develops into in the 19th century. These ritual systems lead to what is known as the Scottish Rite in the United States today. There's also the York Rite, which has degrees related to the Knights Templars and the building of the Second Temple after Babylonian captivity. With a population that reads the Bible every day to perform initiation ceremonies to talk about Zerubbabel and the building of the Second Temple is just the cat's pajamas to them. Because you've been reading the Bible your whole life and to portray those stories of you know, the Exodus or the Garden of Eden or Noah, that's extraordinary stuff. So that was part of the popularity of Freemasonry is that you could perform these stories from the Bible. Okay, let us take a brief moment to talk about our episode's sponsor. And then, Mark, when we get back, we should really explore the role that Freemasonry played in the new United States. Did you know that in addition to being a Freemason, Benjamin Franklin was also an experimenter with diets? It's true. For example, when Franklin was a young man, he read a book on vegetarianism. And he was so convinced by the argument that he decided to become a vegetarian both for its health benefits and to save some money on food. Now, good nutrition is not something that we should skimp on, and yet many of us do. We're busy with life and work, and our daily nutrition just falls by the wayside. Athletic Greens is trying to help us with that. Athletic Greens produces AG1, a powder that contains 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. AG1 was created when the founder of Athletic Greens experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine that cost him roughly $100 a day. He thought there had to be a better way to create an optimal nutritional routine, and AG1 does just that. Not only does AG1 support your gut health, immune system, and nervous system, every purchase of AG1 helps Athletic Greens donate to organizations that help get nutritious food to kids in need, including the No Kid Hungry program here in the United States. Now, I've been trying AG1 every single day for the last couple of weeks. I mix one scoop of AG1 powder with a cup of cold water, and I drink this mixture just before my morning routine. Now, the green powder really does turn the water green, but the mixture has a mild fruity taste that I've actually come to enjoy. Plus, I really like knowing that AG1 is helping me meet my nutritional needs, needs that I really let fall by the wayside because I lead a busy life. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop of AG1 and a cup of water every day. That's it. No more having to take a million different vitamins and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash BFW. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash BFW to take ownership over your health and to pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Okay, let us turn to Freemasonry's role in the new United States. Lydia notes that the new United States developed its own currency after the revolution, and today there is a symbol of Freemasonry on the back of the United States' $1 bill. So if we think about the $1 bill, right, there's George Washington's portrait on the front of the bill, and then there is that symbol of the pyramid with the Eye of Providence on the back side of the bill. Mark, Lydia is curious to know more about the symbol of the pyramid with the Eye of Providence and why it's associated with Freemasonry. First of all, it's not Masonic. I wish it kind of was, but it's not. There's been a lot of conjecture about that, but it's been very clearly stated if you go to the National Archives, and also I would recommend, I think you can find this online, a colleague of mine and a dear friend, S. Brent Morris, has written a great deal about why the symbols on the Great Seal of the United States are not Masonic. And the reason why that story happens, I think, has only occurred in the last 40 or 50 years because I don't believe that the seal was used on the dollar bills until the 1930s. I think Franklin Roosevelt put them on the dollar bills. So it's a relatively recent development in American currency. So Freemasonry borrows from all sorts of different locations and different communities and institutions. A well-known English Masonic historian, John Hamill, once said, There's nothing original in Freemasonry. It borrows from everywhere. The only thing that's unique about it is the assembly of those several parts. So it's borrowing from the Enlightenment ideals. It's borrowing from stonemasons. It's borrowing from the Bible. It's borrowing symbols from wherever it can get its hold on. And because 
the initiation ceremonies and the ritual is a literary genre that people are just writing extensively in the 1700s. Again, similar to opera, similar to other poems or plays or any other genres, that the pyramids, the all-seeing eye, these things are being borrowed from mythology for purposes. Now, this pyramid is not a symbol in ancient craft Freemasonry. It can be used in European systems of Freemasonry, but it's not an American symbol. The all-seeing eye, of course, is a Masonic symbol, but the all-seeing eye goes all the way back to ancient Egypt. It's used in numerous other places. The way we identify a Masonic symbol is if it's connected with other identifiable symbols. So in American Freemasonry, the all-seeing eye is used in conjunction with the sun and the moon and the stars and a comet, because the symbol refers to part of the lecture that refers to how God, the all-seeing eye, oversees the universe, sees the sun and the moon and the comets, and also sees into our hearts and rewards us according to our merits. So you have to see a combination of symbols in the same way that just because there's a symbol of a mountain, that symbol of the mountain could be Mount Sinai, which means that it's Jewish, or it could be Mount Olympus, which is Greek, but just because it's a mountain doesn't mean it's one or the other. So the pyramid can be used in a lot of different ways, and obviously the pyramid appears in a lot of different cultures around the world. The way I view the Great Seal of the United States, it is a new era for the age. It's an unfinished pyramid, and the pyramid will only be completed through divine guidance and supervision, which is the all seeing eye at the top. That's a basic way to interpret that symbol. So these symbols that appear to be Masonic and which are embedded in the Great Seal of the United States and on the back of our $1 bills are not actually connected with Freemasonry. They do not denote any sort of connection between the federal government and Freemasons. No, not at all. And again, because Freemasonry borrows symbols from classical Rome and Greece, because there's stone masonry and there's architecture and there's all that sort of stuff, and the American Republic, our Republic, is predicated on classical Roman and classical Greek, and most of the buildings, the U.S. Capitol, the White House, the National Archives, numerous other buildings and state houses and courthouses all have Ionic, Doric, and Corinthian columns. There's just a jumbling of classical Roman and classical Greek architecture symbols, icons, images flowing back and forth between our new Republic and Masonic symbols and initiation ceremonies. That's not to say that some of this stuff doesn't show up in different forms of Freemasonry. Again, to use a Christian analogy, there are some symbols and Orthodox Christians use more than Roman Catholics or Protestant Christians use. There's different types of iconography. There's different types of hymns. That's not to say that those iconography and hymns are not Christian. They're just not seen in Protestant Christianity as it appears in North America, let's say. So it's a question of stages and it's a question of predominance. For example, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States, which is predicated on a French form of Masonic rituals, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in 1960 had a million Freemasons, which is a huge number. But in 1960, there were 4 million Master Masons. So there's still only 25% of Freemasons. It's a question of percentages and prevalence. Now, Alexandria, Virginia serves as the home of the George Washington Masonic National Memorial Association, which is where Mark works as the association's director of archives and exhibits. Mark, could you tell us a bit more about the George Washington Masonic National Memorial and about your work as the Memorial Association's director of archives and exhibits? Sure, I'd be happy to. So the George Washington Masonic Memorial, the association was founded in 1910 by the leaders of Freemasons from the several states in the United States with the desire to build some sort of permanent fireproof building to first protect some of the valuable artifacts related to Washington that the local lodge, Alexandria Washington Lodge 22, had in their own museum in Old Town, Alexandria. And then that mission grew to make some sort of a lasting monument to Washington the man and his character and virtues. They raised money, they purchased land in the 19-teens and 20s, and in 1922, they broke ground. And in 1923, they did the cornerstone ceremony of the memorial, of which about 15,000 Master Masons from around the country showed up to participate in that. They built the building in Alexandria between 1922 and 1932, and of course, they dedicated it 
during the bicentennial celebration of Washington's birth in 1932. The building's purpose, like the Lincoln Memorial or the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., is to recognize the character and virtue of Washington. The Washington Monument in the District of Columbia is to Washington the statesman. Mount Vernon down the river is to Washington's private life and his biography. The memorial is dedicated to his virtue and character, those virtues that are so necessary to maintain a free society and to maintain a republic. So the memorial's mission continues to do that in time and over the last 80 years. We've had more and more Masonic organizations meet here, the local Masonic organizations, and we've done different exhibits and different displays. We have a theater. We have a lot of other functions that go on here. We're now focusing back on the education and moving back towards articulating the virtues and characters of George Washington. And with the book that I just finished being published by the University of Virginia Press, that lays out the evidence and the facts about Washington's life and his membership in Freemasonry. And that sets the stage for the Memorial Association to move towards greater education of Washington's characters and virtues. And I've been here at the Memorial for 16 years. Prior to that, I worked in museums in Massachusetts and in Pittsburgh and St. Louis. So I was a historian and a curator first before I became interested in Freemasonry. And then I became interested in American fraternalism. And then I got a job working in a Masonic Museum and I joined Freemasonry along the way. Is this a national memorial and museum that Anyone can visit and use its collections, or do you have to be a Freemason to be able to visit this memorial and use whatever archival collections that the association has? No, it's always been open to the public. And unfortunately, of course, through the last couple of years because of COVID, we've been limited to who we could bring in. And certainly in the last six months, we've been largely closed to the public. We do special tours and guided tours, and people can go online and make reservations for group tours. We are now starting to work towards opening fully back up to the public. We're looking to hire tour guides and start that whole process. When we fully open, we probably be open seven days a week as we were in the past. We do various tours and we charge a mission. The issue we've had during COVID is because we have elevators that take people up to the top of the building, which is about 330 feet high and has a spectacular view of the Potomac Valley, is we can't fit people on elevators with the fear of COVID. So that looks like it's abating, thank God, and we should be able to get back to fully functioning museum as so many other museums around the country have been desperate to get back to serve the public and to fulfill their mission. Now, before we jump into the time warp, Mark, is there a particular aspect of early American Freemasonry that you'd really like us to know more about? Or is there a particular aspect of Freemasonry that you wish people better understood? I think there is, and I don't think it's understood yet because there's been so much mythology that has been perpetuated by well-intentioned Freemasons and then just popular culture. So this idea that the founding fathers were all Freemasons and they were all noble and great and good and they never did wrong and that all the decisions were the right ones and that life was very clean and not messy and there weren't any hypocrites amongst the founding generation. Of course, that's convoluted stuff and we know it's not true. They were flawed and confused individuals as you and I are and everybody alive is. But when you do that social history, which I'm primarily interested in, and you start identifying where these lodges were at and how they grew, then you see the growth of social institutions and civic institutions, which unites the country today. So after Freemasonry grows, you have all these other organizations, the Odd Fellows, all the ethnic organizations, as I mentioned before, the Sons of Norway, the Sons of Italy, You have this vast panorama of fraternal organizations that actually build and strengthen community life in America and actually provide the real strength of American society that's not predicated on religion, not predicated on politics, is predicated on fraternity. And in my almanac and the other work that I do, I'm interested in how they grow from a few lodges on, you know, the eastern seaboard and how they're connected from man to man, community to community, because each charter lists the founding members, and those members then went on to the next town over and founded another lodge. So beyond the founding fathers, who were the Freemasons who were mayors and governors and state senators and representatives, who were judges, who were leaders in industries or the communities, who were the first presidents of colleges, who were the bishops and pastors and local churches that were Freemasons? And how are they building civic society? 
after the American Revolution, you had to grow those kind of institutions in the Ohio country and Kentucky as the United States moved west too. And Freemasonry is a good indication of how that development happened. And that's what I'm interested in because for the last hundred years, and I largely blame my brother Masons, they've been interested in the big stories, the grand mythology, the myths and legends surrounding Freemasonry as this spectacularly important story surrounding George Washington or Benjamin Franklin. I would rather get down to the individual men and their families and how they built their communities after 1783 and how they expanded their lives moving west into the mountains, across the mountains, into the Ohio country. So that, to me, seems to be the most interesting part of Freemasonry. Not the symbols or the ritual, though they're interested in themselves, not the conspiracy theories, which have its own interest, but actually how individual men and their families took care of each other through a network of fraternal lodges. And now we should jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Mark, in your opinion, what might have happened if some of the founding fathers had never been Freemasons? How might the movement toward American independence have been different without any influence from Freemasonry? I don't think that it would have been much different. There was about 100 lodges at the beginning of the revolution. And of those 100 lodges, if you said there's 20 members per lodge, we're not talking a lot of members. And they're scattered, again, from all the way from Savannah, Georgia, all the way up to Falmouth, Maine, or Portland, Maine. And some of them were very rural and small, like Fredericksburg Lodge, where Washington was a member. I don't think that they had a great impact because there were just other means that the information, the knowledge, the communications that were necessary to ferment sedition against the crown, to organize a continental congress, to do these other things that were necessary to attempt independence from the British crown. I think Freemasonry was an ingredient in that, but it was not a prominent ingredient in that. It was an aspect of that, but it was not the deciding factor. If Freemasonry didn't exist, there would have been other types of organizations or other means to perpetuate that form of communication. But I think Freemasonry, I don't like the word inevitable, but I think Freemasonry is a natural product of the enlightenment of greater ability to communicate through postal services, greater ability to read books because there's ever growing number of printing presses, growing number of colleges and divinity schools that allow that great orders and a middle class that has the time and the inclination to want to read books, to have orations, to communicate, to read newspapers. And Freemasonry is just a product of that. In addition to working at the George Washington Masonic National Memorial Association, Mark is also the author of a book called A Deserving Brother, George Washington and Freemasonry. Mark, would you tell us about your book, A Deserving Brother? When I started working here at the memorial 15 years ago, 16 years ago, I was under the impression that everything on George Washington's membership in Freemasonry was known. And then I discovered that was not true. And it was frustrating because it wasn't done. And I expressed my frustration to a professor friend who told me that maybe I was the solution to my own problem. So I decided I guess I'd better write the book myself. So because there's so much misinformation, And because there's no academic book or scholarly paper that's ever really been written on Washington's membership in Freemasonry, I had to sort through a vast amount of bad, good, and indifferent information, largely indifferent and largely cribbed from two or three sources that were published in the 1800s. So over a period of time, I developed a database because I'm more of a curator, collections manager than I am a historian. And I slowly put together an outline of every document, every book every letter and artifact related to Washington. And then I decided that I wasn't going to write a dissertation because, again, I'm not that type of person, but I could at least present a book that itemized and provided the transcriptions of all the letters and the proof of Washington's membership. And then I could set that proof out in a book that would force its detractors of this idea that Washington was a Mason or the people, the myth makers or the storytellers to come in contact with this. And then I'll also provide the basic information 
for academics and more serious scholars to take this information or this evidence and make sense to it in a broader context. And over a period of three or four years, wrote the book providing context to the letters and to the artifacts and providing images of the minute books that show Washington attending lodges or the books that were sent to him by Freemasons. So that is strictly an evidence book. There is some contextual narrative. We explain how Freemasonry grows during Washington's lifetime. But Washington is not the protagonist. Freemasonry comes to him and he responds to it. Freemasonry as an institution and individual Freemasons who Washington encounters in Rhode Island or in South Carolina or in Virginia are developing the fraternity as they're trying to develop the new republic. And so the book is both Washington's interaction with Freemasonry, but also an insight onto how Freemasonry is changing and adapting as younger generations of men post-revolution are finding ways to adapt the fraternity to the new world. Where is the best place for us to look for more information about your new book, as well as about you and how we can contact you? You're welcome to send me emails through the George Washington Masonic Memorial. Their website is easily found, gwmma.org, and my email is mtabbert at gwmasonicmemorial.org. I also have my own website, markatabbert.com. The book can be found on Amazon. It can be found through the memorial's website. The last thing I would say, because this is a very common question I get, if your grandfather or your ancestor was a Freemason, the best place to find out if he was a Freemason and where he was a Freemason is through the state in which he was, because there's no national archive. So if your grandfather was a Freemason in South Dakota, contact the Grand Lodge of Masons in South Dakota. There are Masonic libraries, great Masonic libraries in Iowa and New York, Philadelphia and Boston and elsewhere. There are thousands of books written about Freemasonry. A lot of that stuff's been digitized. So the first place to go is to really use the Masonic websites that exist there to do that kind of research. Mark Tabert, we've really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us and for helping us explore Freemasonry in early America. Thank you for having me. I've had a great time. Freemasonry is not a secret society. It is not conspiring to take over the world as has so often been portrayed in movies like National Treasure or books by authors like Dan Brown. Rather, Freemasonry is a fraternal brotherhood, a brotherhood of men who work to improve themselves by improving their understanding of morals and of virtuous behavior. Now, as Mark related, Freemasonry has been around for at least 300 years, and it may have been around for longer than that. No one knows for sure when the first Masonic Lodge opened, but we do know that the Grand Lodge of England opened in London around 1721. We also know that would-be colonists brought Freemasonry with them as they migrated to North America and settled in its port towns and frontier areas. Freemasonry was really a tool that colonists used to locate one another. They wanted to locate like-minded men and men from the same regions that they'd migrated from. So with these Masonic rituals in hand, these men opened lodges. Lodges that likely inspired the creation of other lodges within the same colony or state or within new frontier areas. As Mark noted, there is still so much research to be done concerning the role of Freemasonry and individual Masons in building the American Republic's civil society. Just like during the American Revolution, it does seem clear, though, that individual Freemasons took active and leading roles in developing many of the early institutions and civic norms of the early United States. It also seems clear that while individual Freemasons took on these active and leading roles in the American Revolution and in the building of the new United States, Freemasonry itself, Freemasonry, the institution, did not play an active role. It's a fraternal organization meant to inspire men to improve themselves and better their communities. You'll find more information about Mark, his books, Almanac of Freemasonry, and A Deserving Brother, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 329. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So please be a good friend and tell your friends about Ben Franklin's World. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Omohundro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Jessica Brabble, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. 
To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, are there other aspects of Freemasonry in early America or perhaps individual Freemasons that you would like to know more about? Tell me, Liz, at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.